Well, it's my privilege um, to bring you the Word of God this, as uh, Brendan said, first Sunday of October and lead off the first of five messages highlighting the five wonderful solas of the Reformation. And uh, before we dive in there, let's go ahead and go to the throne of grace and ask the Lord to <clears throat> bless this time in his word. Pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you for your magnificent word. We thank you that throughout the centuries you have protected it and preserved it and given it to us. And we, we praise you for that. And we thank you that the written word is a testimony to, indeed, the one who is the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that you would help us today to just appreciate the Bible. Help us to stand in awe of its beauty and majesty and glory and Father, we just uh, commit our time to you and pray that by the power of your spirit, you would touch our hearts, even as we reflect upon things that many of us know and hold so dear. It is just good to be reminded. It's good to be refreshed. It's good to consider your majesty expressed through this wonderful book. So help us, Lord, we pray and pray that you'd build up the saints and uh, Father, even as we uh, will talk at the end of the sermon about the beautiful person the book points to, may you touch the hearts of any who have walked in here who need to hear the gospel. So we commit this time to you for the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name, we truly thank you and praise you. Amen. Well, I think it's uh, appropriate to begin this season, uh, remembering the Reformation with Sola Scriptura, because it's foundational, really, to all the others, all the other solas. Uh, the Scriptures alone are the only divine source of truth concerning the great truths of the gospel. The Word of God absolutely and clearly declares that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And uh, last week, if you were here, I hope you were, uh, Rick did a great job of setting the historical background of the Reformation, uh, showing us how God moved in history and, and raised up men like Martin Luther and John Calvin and many others, not, not just the two of them, to take a stand against the authority of the Roman Catholic Church with its man-centered and anti-biblical traditions which it used to control individuals and even nations, as we learned last week. The church set its authority above and over that of the Bible in its perverted quest to gain and increase political and ecclesiastical power and wealth. The issue in the Reformation was one of authority. And you know, the enemy from the very beginning has been trying to undermine the authority of the Word of God. In the garden, Satan talking to Eve. Indeed, has God said, he's never stopped trying to undermine the authority of this book. And praise God in his sovereign providence. He used vessels of clay like Luther and Calvin to take a stand against the powerful darkness of the Roman Church and declare that the scriptures alone have the final and absolute authority concerning all matters of salvation, faith, and practice which they wanted to control and define 
the reformers declared that the scriptures, as opposed to being superseded by the authority of the church, sit in judgment over any papal decrees, traditions, and practices. The reformers brought the church back to the objectivity of God's written word interpreted correctly. We'll talk more about that as we go along. And well, the church tried desperately to prevent the scriptures from being proclaimed and given to the people in its attempt to maintain its power, power but what, what's going on? It could not stop the omnipotent power of the God of the Bible from reestablishing his word to its rightful place of authority in his church for his glory. And you know, here we sit today. This is, this is a Bible church, people. I bet there's just hundreds of Bibles in this place right now. All shapes and sizes, different translations on iPads, on phones, all over, Bibles, right? That's what we're all about. Even the little kids, Bibles, adults, Bibles. It's marvelous. But here's, the, here's what we can't forget. As we have our Bibles in our hands, many faithful saints, and Brendan talked about this, and We'll sing about it even at the end of the service. We're willing to die. They were willing to die so that you and I can have his precious word in our language. We must never forget or take for granted as you hold this Bible today in your hands, the privilege of having in your hands the word of the living God. Unbelievable think we take it for granted, don't we? There are places on this planet where they just would like to have a page of this book in their possession because the government is against it and thwarts it being disseminated. Throughout history, Bibles have been burned. They've been, it, the Word of God has been, the enemy has tried to suppress it and get rid of it. It can't happen. So, the Reformation cry Sola Scriptura. And I, all I want this morning during our time together is to just reflect on the majesty and the beauty and the authority and the glory of the Bible today. Things you know, I'm sure, about, but it never hurts to be reminded. It's never wrong to be refreshed and encouraged in the things we're going to talk about today. And maybe some of you uh, have not thought through or heard the kinds of things we'll be discussing. Uh, essentially, we're going to look at about six different uh, ideas concerning the Word of God as we move along. Topical message for you. So let's begin by being reminded first that the Bible is a unique book. Unique. One of a kind. It's a one of a kind book. The world is full of books, right? Over the centuries, good, bad, and ugly books. But there's only one Bible. There's only one unique book like the Bible. And it's unique because it is a supernatural book. Supernatural. Because it is the word of the living God. And he stands behind every word on every page, because that's true, it is a living book, because he is alive and stands behind it. Hebrews 4.12, familiar. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, the word of God in the hands of the Holy Spirit is a powerful living book that can change lives and convert dead sinners into those who love Christ and God. It's, it's, it's powerful. It's powerful. Second, 
The Bible is a unique living book because it is an inspired book. You've all heard that. It's inspired, right? There's different ideas about what inspiration means. But I want you to get this definition down today. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. You know, this doctrine of inspiration is a magnificent doctrine. It highlights really the miraculous power of God in giving us his word. This, this is a miraculous book. This is a marvelous doctrine, inspiration. Uh, the Greek word literally means God breathed. God breathed. And, and so what we're seeing in this text in Timothy is that the entire scripture, all 66 books, are directly sourced out of God himself. The image here is that the Bible is the result of the breath of God giving it to us. Even though written by men, as we will see, they are God's very words recorded in Scripture. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said to the devil, remember when he was interacting with the enemy during his temptation, time of temptation, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And in the context, what does Jesus do? He repeats citations from Deuteronomy to answer every temptation he's confronted with by the enemy, confirming that the words that proceed from the mouth of God are the written scriptures, the written scriptures that you hold in your hands. Amazing. Well, theologically, theologians... Uh, typically define inspiration uh, this way, something like this. And here's a quote from one of them. God superintended the human authors of the Bible so that they composed and recorded without error his message to mankind in the words of their original writing. So let's think a little bit about it, just to appreciate this miracle, this miracle you're holding in your hands, this inspired book, the only one ever given to men by God. We want to appreciate it. So first, looking at some of these ideas, God superintended over the human authors of the Bible in this process of inspiration. Wow, just think about that. How does that work? Peter speaks about how God did this in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. But know this first of all, Peter says, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. It translates directly into the recording of those words. So the Holy Spirit super, superintended over the men who wrote Scripture. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. That same word is used in Acts to talk to us about how the ship Paul was on was being driven along by the wind of the storm. The ship was taken where the wind drove it. Men rode under the superintending, powerful ministry of the Spirit of God. This is supernatural, people. This is miraculous. What God did to give us his word. They composed the Bible without error. Wow. How can any other book have that claim? This means that the human authors were, they weren't just inactive puppets. God wasn't just dictating things and they're writing it down. They weren't passive stenographers in this process to whom God dictated everything. They were active writers. We know what that's 
like. You sit down and you write something that you think about and you write it down to save your thoughts. And under the Holy Spirit superintending, each author wrote in accordance with their own personalities, levels of learning, and literary skills. They weren't all the same. God used the writers of Scripture with their unique talents and insights and perspectives to give us His very words. He used a fisherman, an uneducated fisherman like Peter, and He used a highly educated rabbi like Paul to give us His word as the Spirit superintendent. I think that's amazing. Have you ever thought about that? The miracle of this book you hold in your hands. These men, under the Spirit superintending ministry, wrote without error. We'll talk about that. The Bible's own claim for itself is that it is truth from the lips of Jesus. Sanctify them in truth during that great prayer in John 17. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word, your word is truth. This is truth. Dear people, the truth that comes from God to us. Truth, without error. Everything God wanted us to have. And we also have, as part of the definition, the fact that this inspiration applies to the original manuscripts that were written. First time Paul wrote Romans or any of the letters, or the Gospels. It's with, it goes with the original manuscripts. It's very important to have that idea with regard to the Word of God in their original writings. And as we talk about that, first note that the words are inspired. The words, okay? Um, we take that for granted, but some people would try to say that the words are not inspired because they kind of try to find error in the Bible, but only the ideas and the meanings, they're inspired, though. They're inspired. The meaning is inspired that, that, that's being conveyed, but here's the point. Without inspired words, there can be no inspired meaning, can there? Can't be any inspired meaning without inspired words. Jesus said in Matthew 5.18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Okay? Every letter of this book is inspired by God. <laughs> the, the smallest Hebrew letter is uh, called the Yod, and it's like an apostrophe in English that you might be using. It's, that, it's small. And this idea of a stroke, and you'll have to think with me because I know sooner or later we're going to be able to put things up and write things and you can see the overhead, but just think with me a minute, okay, about how this works. Can you, can you imagine in your mind an, an English L? There's, a, there's a, a vertical line and then a horizontal line. You got that? Yes. Down and over. And just, we're going to kind of do it backwards, but just flip that up. So you have a vertical line and a horizontal line, an L. Okay. And if you were to take that horizontal line and just give a little bit more to the left of the vertical line, that's a stroke. Just a little, little bit. And that, that stroke in the Hebrew language, that little extension of that vertical or that, that, that horizontal line past the vertical line changes the Hebrew letters. And what, so what's Jesus telling us? From the smallest Hebrew letter to the stroke that changes one Hebrew letter into another Hebrew letter by just that little stroke. You can see it in the Hebrew language. That is inspired by God. Wow. Wow. 
That's amazing. When you start thinking about that, you start having to think about the fact that every word, every sentence, every paragraph, every train of thought, every figure of speech, everything in this book is inspired by God exactly what he wants you to have so you can know him. Wow. Unbelievable. Second, the doctrine of inspiration, as we said, applies only to the original writings, not to copies, translations. No matter how accurate they may be, the original manuscripts were inspired. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have God's word in our hands today. Because God has done a marvelous preserving supernatural, preserving power to protect his word, to give it to us through those copies that we have that are available to us to have 100% of the original text in our hands. 100%. It's marvelous what he has done. If he can supernaturally inspire every little stroke, can he pre preserve the word for us? Yes, he can. And he has done that. He has done that for us. Third, then, because the Bible is inspired... It is inerrant, without error. The doctrine of inerrancy is intimately connected to the doctrine of inspiration. I hope you can see that. If the Bible is inspired by God, then it must reflect the very character of God in its content. Isn't that fair? This means that when it speaks to an issue, any issue, it speaks to it gives us truth. It speaks truth. Many passages clearly state that God cannot lie or speak falsely. Isn't that true? Can't do it. It's not part of his nature. So the inerrancy of Scripture, as one theologian states, means that Scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. The definition in simple terms just means that the Bible always tells the truth and that it always tells the truth concerning everything it talks about. Doesn't matter what it is. And the scope of that, in, in, that inspiration is amazing. And that inerrancy defines who God is. He tells us who He is. It describes us and our great need for Him to take the initiative to change us and save us. It defines the world and what's going on in the world because of man's sin and, and how it all works. It defines its origins for us, history and ultimate fate of the world, right? It tells us about the enemy and what's going on in the world system defines the natural and the supernatural. We live in a supernatural world, contrary to what our society would try to tell us. There's an enemy at work, but God is working as well, okay? We live in a rationalistic society, right? Don't talk to me about supernatural stuff. You can't prove that stuff, right? Define sin and salvation life and godliness, everything the Bible talks about is true because it's inspired by God. Inspired by God. Everything. So why is this doctrine of inerrancy so important? Just think a little bit about it. <laughs> because men have tried to undermine this doctrine throughout history and, 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 and kind of come up with different shades of meaning for inspiration, whether it's just the thoughts or whether it's Whatever level they, but not the exact letters. No, that's a little bit too far. We don't, we don't like that idea. If every word of Scripture is inspired, then to deny inerrancy is to cast doubt, to impugn the truthfulness of God's character. Isn't that fair? If every word is, if there's a mistake, it has to do with God's character. Right? I think that's fair. 
If we deny the total inerrancy of Scripture, how do we know we can trust God in anything He has said? For Because some would say that Scripture has errors when it speaks to areas like history or modern scientific observations. It's got some errors. But when it talks to the issue of salvation and faith and practice, it's inerrant. How do you know? How do you know? Who's going to determine what words are true in what areas and where the errors are? You? Me? And this leads to the next problem. If we deny the inerrancy of Scripture, then we set ourselves up. And that's what men like to do. We set ourselves up as the final standard of judging truth from error in the Scripture. We have then no standard of objective truth, right? Do people in our culture acknowledge objective truth? No, they don't. We define what truth is, not some book like this. Okay? The Bible claims to be inerrant. If it's not inerrant, we have a problem there. It's not reliable then. And, and here's the final thing, which I really think is why the enemy attacks this so fiercely. If we deny the inerrancy of the inspired text, we undermine the authority of the scriptures. Isn't that true? You undermine the authority of this book. Inspiration and inerrancy are tied directly to the authority of the Bible. Um, and fourthly then, because the Bible is inspired, it has divine authority and is eternal truth. This, this, was the great, this was the great conflict highlighted by the Reformation. It comes down to this issue of authority. Where does ultimate authority reside? when declaring truth about salvation and faith and practice, the church or the scriptures. And here's what's so marvelous about it. When reformers like Luther and Calvin uh, uh, got those original texts that Rick talked about being brought back into the picture, the Hebrew and Greek texts of scripture, and, and, and they, they're looking at these very words and the significance of the divine authority of these inspired texts of Scripture is gripping them. And they understood the clear teaching of Scripture, seeing how it blatantly contradicted the teaching and practice of the church. You can see there's a conflict coming. So they stood against the power of the church on the authority of the Bible and were willing to die for their convictions based on the truths it declared. Folks, uh, again, they brought the church back to this objective authority of God's written word interpreted correctly. And that's part of the Reformation. Rick, Rick mentioned this, this idea of hermeneutics because even though the Bible is a supernatural inspired book, it's still a book, isn't it? It has to do with language and grammar and syntax and context and the languages of Greek and Hebrew, okay? Um, these men understood that. They understood what had to happen with this text and where the, the authority resided Calvin, and they were men of the book, folks. These, these were godly men of the book. Calvin said, here you have this text in front of you with its authority. It is the first business of an interpreter to let his author say what he does instead of attributing to him what we think he ought to say. How often does that happen even today? I'll just make this word say what I want it to. I'll hold it up and tell people what I think. Who cares what you think? I want to know what God has to say. I don't care what you think. I'm not trying to be, you know, heavy-handed. I just don't care. If what you think lines up with this book, amen. Amen. Right? 
the authority. Listen to what, listen, listen to what old Martin said, Martin Luther, 1533. For a number of years, I have now annually read through the Bible twice. Man, I, have, I can't even get through it once. He's doing it twice. And he didn't have an iPad, and he couldn't carry it around. He, we're talking Martin Luther. If the Bible were, listen to this heart this man had to know this book. If the Bible were a large, mighty tree, and all its words were little branches, I have tapped at all the branches, eager to know what was there and what it had to offer. Every word he cared about. When he came to an understanding of the doctrine of justification by faith in Romans, it's, he said that he just meditated and thought day after day and said like he was beating on Paul, I've got to know the truth, I don't understand. And God finally gave him the understanding that changed the world. Because he was determined to know the truth from this book. It's God's word, people. Man. Are you like that? We need to be people of the book, right? We have all the resources at our finger. We have Bibles galore. How many of them are just sitting on the shelf and not being picked up and read and studied and thought about? Engaging your minds, loving God with all your mind is part of how we love him. Right? We all can do better at it. And we're going to see as we move toward the end that there's a reason why we, we need to do it. This is not an academic exercise, people. It's about eternal life. Eternal life. So, just a couple implications for us with respect to the Bible's authority. First, I think this is important. The Bible is not a book to be trifled with. Not a book to be trifled with. <laughs> like God himself, because it's his word, it's a book that needs to be approached with reverence and respect. Reverence and respect. Right? We had this up on our screen, Psalm 119, 89. Brent read it. Forever, O Lord, forever, your word is settled in heaven. Unchanging, settled eternally because it's his word. Wow. Dear people, the word of God is this inscripturated, eternal, divine truth. Here's an interesting observation. At the beginning of the Bible, in the first five books written by Moses, God states with respect to his word... Deuteronomy 4, 2, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you. You don't add to it. Nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Deuteronomy. The last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. Oh, don't you, you don't mess with this book. Psalm 138.2, I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word according to all your name. People, God's name and reputation are directly related to his word and his great promises. He, his reputation, his name is caught up in this book. Right? That's why it's so important to approach it with the reverence and respect it deserves. It is not a book to be lightly esteemed or irreverently messed with. What happens in our culture today? Oh, man, it's being irreverently messed with by a lot of people. It's being undermined. 
in its authority at every point. Listen to what Peter says. To distort the truths of this book has serious, even eternal consequences. Peter, when speaking about Paul's writings, I'm going to read you a little a quote from uh, states in 2 Peter 3, 13 through 16. Listen to what he says. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and new earth, consummation in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You just don't pick this book up and, 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 and import your own ideas into it and just tell us what you think it means or build doctrines that are contrary to the truth of this book like the church has done in the past. Notice how Peter even equates Paul's writing here to Scripture itself. Right? Man, this is... It's serious when you deal with this book. I'm not trying to keep any of you from it. I'm saying... As you approach it, have the reverence and respect that is due to it because it's God's word to us. Truth, eternal truth. This is why Paul exhorted Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. He said, you know this, men, ladies. Be diligent, Paul said to Timothy, his young disciple, to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed Accurately handling the word of truth. Is it, is it possible to handle it inaccurately? Yes. So what's the man of God to strive to do? To handle it accurately. It's God's word. This is why Paul exhorted Timothy in 1 Timothy, and I really like this. And Man, this is the ministry of the word of God in the church. In 4.13 and 15 and 16, listen to what Paul says. Timothy, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. <clears throat> Take pains with these things, Timothy. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention, Timothy, to yourself and your, to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you, eternal souls are on the line, people. When you come into this church and the ministry of the Word of God is taking place, eternal souls are at stake. It needs to be done right. Right? We want everybody in this place to make it to heaven. That's why it's so important that the ministry of the Word be done right. Correctly, this is what Calvin and Luther were all about. Luther was not only a seminary professor, but he was a pastor. That man cared about his people, which is why he spent so much time getting into the Word to understand, so he could communicate truth to them, because he knew the weight of what he was doing, and their souls were on the line. It hasn't changed. So we we need this. God gives teachers to the church, but. This is also why Paul commended the Bereans after he brought the truths of the gospel to them. In Acts 17, 10, and 11, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Why? For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily, to see whether these things were so. Here's an implication for us, people. To be like the Bereans, you have to understand how to examine the Scriptures for yourself. Right? Man, this is why at Southside we want everyone to have a basic understanding of Bible study methods and the proper principles of biblical interpretation, that's called hermeneutics, 
right? Yes, the Lord gives gifted teachers to the church. Praise God for men like John MacArthur and John Piper and R.C. Sproul and men that he gives to the church to help us understand. He gives that to the local body too, right? But that does not excuse you or anyone here from your own personal responsibility to confirm the things you are being taught. Can men make mistakes? Yes. All of us, teachers included, sit under the authority of the Word of God. There are no popes here at Southside. Don't you let that happen with you. Don't you come here and say, oh, I know, hey, I trust these men. I'm glad you do, but we're just men. This is the inspired word. Boy, we need to, you need to learn so you can confirm. Not to be argumentative, but to confirm. Do you spend any time doing that? When's the last time you heard something in a class or from a sermon and you thought, well, I don't understand that. I better go check that out. Or you just, hey, that's okay. Ken said it. We're just going to press on. No problem. I'm not knocking Ken. In fact, I miss his smiling face over here. That dear man who labors in the word to do it right for you. But we're just men. We're just men. And let me point something else out to you with regard to the authority of this book. This is pretty sobering. Once the truth of the gospel was delivered by the apostles and then inspired in the writings of Scripture, even they sat under its authority. You remember what Paul said in Galatians 1, 6 through 8? I'm amazed you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of God for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, even if I, Paul says, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you. He is to be accursed. What happened when Peter started to mess up in Galatians? And started by his behavior to kind of cast some doubts on the clear meaning of the gospel. Paul says, I opposed him to his face. Because his behavior was not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Paul and Peter, once that Truth is inscripturated after it's been declared under the inspiration of the Spirit. They sat under its authority. What about us? Man. Dear people, God's Word sits in judgment over all men and their interpretations, ideas, and opinions, doesn't it? Please have that kind of heart and attitude. The Bible alone gives us everything we need to know and believe in order to enter into an eternal love relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. Remember Ken preaching on 1 Peter chapter 1, 20 through 23 through 25, for you have been born again, as we even had earlier, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. Imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. It's a live book. It's alive because <laughs> God stands behind. For all flesh is like grass. Man, we're going to fade away. This book is eternal. The truths in this book are eternal. And they're going to impact you for the rest of eternity because God's promises are fulfilled forever from this book. That includes me and you participating in these great eschatological events that are coming. He's made promises to us people that he will not break. Right? And Peter said, this is the word. The word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. And I pray that never changes in this place. And here's an implication. Aren't, aren't we living in an ever-increasing dark land in the United States? On every side, the enemy is trying to undermine the authority of the Bible. Everywhere you turn, all the philosophies of this culture 
to the point where we declare what's right wrong and what's wrong right in our opinion. <laughs> Everywhere you turn, from evolution to humanism to postmodernism to anything that's going on, the uh, psychology, everything is designed by the enemy to undermine the authority of this book. And you know what? The, sometimes we start to buy into that stuff. We buy into it. We were talking about that even this morning in Ecclesiastes. You start to be swayed by stuff. Yes, and, and, and you can subtly be tempted to undermine the authority of the Bible yourself by just not obeying everything it tells you to do. I like this part, but over here, I, I, that's pretty hard. I, I, I want to obey that, but my situation is unique. And that doesn't really apply to me. Wait a minute, time out. And let me just say this. If you're going to stand for the truth in this dark society like the reformers did, you need to have the personal conviction that you are ready to suffer and possibly die for the truth of God's word, not the opinions of any man or woman. You better know what you're dying for comes from this book and is true. Right? Wouldn't it be terrible to be put on the spot and you don't have the convictions they did? My conscience is bound by the word of God. I believe these truths. I'm not going to compromise. I'll die. Okay. Okay, that was, uh, there was a lot to that section. And let me move on to the fifth point because these next two, these final two points really go together. Fifth, not just the authority, the things we've mentioned. Because the Bible is inspired it has unity. This is, this is miraculous, people. <laughs> this is really miraculous. This is part of its supernatural, miraculous nature. Though recorded by approximately 40 human authors over 1,500 years, the Bible is the work of one author. Who is it? God himself. Because the Bible has one single divine author, as a comprehensive whole from Genesis to Revelation, it has both divine unity and purpose. And the purpose is to set a wonderful person on display. Just a couple thoughts. The divine unity, this divine unity means that the Bible is God's progressive revelation from beginning to end must be consistent. Is God going to contradict himself? What do you think? You're going to hear something about him in Genesis that's not true when you get to the New Testament about his character or person? No. It's going to be consistent. He might give you new additional revelation as we move through the Bible, but that additional revelation is not going to contradict what he has said in the beginning. Okay, that's fair. New revelation is not going to contradict what has come before because of who he is. It has to be coherent. It's going to make sense as it unfolds. As you deal with texts and understand them in their context through the progress of our relation, there must be overall clarity and validity to the divine plan supported by those individual texts. The reformers looked at it as, hey, there's a, a scripture helps us determine scripture, truth. You know, there's not, there's not going to be this kind of confliction or incoherence. And then finally, it has to be congruent. As revelation progresses, the individual parts must fit together, together to give us this cohesive whole. It's especially true with respect to God's unfolding promises. You know, he obligates himself to do things. Aren't you glad that he does? He's promised to take you home to glory. Is he going to fulfill that? You better believe it. He's made great and magnificent promises throughout the Scripture, and he's going to be faithful to fulfill his word because he's obligated himself to act in that fulfillment. Wow. His promises really are the backbone of the coherency and cohesiveness of Scripture. Okay? One final point. I like this point. So do I, can I get some extra time? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sixth, and finally this morning, the inspired, unified, divine book, Sola Scriptura, points to an infinitely beautiful divine person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why this is so important. 
It's not an academic exercise. This book, this divine inspired unified book points to a magnificent divine person, the Lord Jesus Christ. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. On the road to Emmaus, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer, the Messiah to suffer these things? Isaiah 53, and then to enter into his glory, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the inspired divine scriptures. It's about him. Romans 1, this is Paul's take on it. 1 through 4, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, concerning his son. There's the gospel. There's the content of the gospel. It's not just a set of theological truths. It's a person, an eternal divine person is the gospel. He is the gospel. Right? who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel is all about him. My favorite text, if you know me, you know I had to get it into the message. Colossians 1, 13 through 17. But the point is it's, it's telling you the focus of this book. Get this, the Father he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We're going to talk about that as we close. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him or in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him. He's the hands-on creator and for him, for his glory and exaltation. Wow. Including your little life. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And let's finish up this morning. Going back to Luke 24, 44 through 48. Listen to this. Now he said to them. This is prior to the ascension. This was after his resurrection. The end of the book of Luke, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That is the whole Old Testament. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So let me close this morning by proclaiming to you this good news. When John saw Jesus coming to begin his public ministry, what did he declare? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we don't like to talk about sin in our society, do we? We've redefined everything in terms of our society so that there is no more sin. It's either disease or it's, you know, the environment or whatever it is. It's not sin. It's lifestyle choices that we can make. We can do what we want. We've put our stamp of approval on sin. We've, we've done it at the end of Romans 1. We heartily approve of people who violate God's truth and we give hearty approval to it because we're wicked. We declare good, right, right, wrong. It's according to my personal free choices. But dear people, and some of you need to hear, we all need to hear, the gospel is about being saved from the consequences of your sin against an infinite, holy God who wrote this book and tells us your condition before him. Society is not the standard of right and wrong. God's word is the standard of right and wrong. Right? His word is the standard. All of us have offended this 
infinitely holy God. Everybody who wa has walked in this door in our character and our lifestyle, our character and our conduct, we've offended him. We've ignored him. We've spurned him. We've hated him. We've lived for ourselves. We've not loved and adored or worshipped him the way he deserves. We all deserve one thing from him, just condemnation and righteous judgment because of this sin against him. That's who we are. Everyone here. No one is exempt. So how can you escape the awful judgment you deserve? How can I? How can you? How can we? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You need to turn from your sins. That's repentance. And you need to lay your hands on the head of the Lamb. In the Old Testament, they would... Century after century, when they violated God's law, they'd bring that little animal to the altar, and the priest, would its throat would be cut while they had their hands laid on its head. What's the point? This innocent animal's getting what I deserve. I violated your law, God. I deserve justice. But God gives them a picture of a substitute, lamb, right? So when Jesus comes, John says, he is the lamb he is the Lamb of God. And how do you lay your hands on that lamb while its throat is cut? By faith. You lay your hands on him by faith. You embrace him as your sin substitute, taking your place under the hand of God's omnipotent, holy wrath. And he propitiates it all infinite in his value and his sacrifice. He takes the fullness of the wrath of God deserved by you in your place by faith. Isn't that good news? Well, that's good news. Some of you need to embrace him by faith this morning. Stop thinking the wrong way thinking that somehow you're going to measure up, thinking that somehow traditions will save you, thinking that somehow you can mix all the things of our society and come out smelling like a rose. You can't. You can't. There's only one way. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Dear people, I'll tell you what Jesus said. Come to me. He said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to Jesus this morning. This is the good news. This is what he commanded his apostles and his disciples to get out there and proclaim about him. And I'm saying on the authority of this book this morning, if you embrace him by faith, he will not turn you away. He'll bring you into the family. He'll cover you with his righteousness and his shed blood, and you'll be able to begin to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll understand truth from this word, and when the fires of temptation and trial come, you'll stand, because the Lord is able to make you stand by his grace. Let's pray. Sola Scripture. Father, we thank you for this marvelous book. It's a supernatural book. It's a book that sets on display one infinitely glorious divine person so that we might know and see your beauty in his face, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help every person who walked in the door here today to appreciate the Bible they have in their hands, to never take it lightly. Men have died so that we can have this truth and this gospel and go out and proclaim it and see men and women and boys and girls delivered from sin and death and the law and eternal destruction through the blood of the Lamb, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, who is indeed coming again to fulfill all promise and prophecy. And for all eternity, we will see more of your infinite beauty in his wonderful face. Oh, God, we long to be there with you, Jesus. Come for us today. We pray. For the glory of your great name, thank you for your word. Indeed, the scriptures alone, sola scriptura, is our battle cry. Amen.